The local lecture is going to lead off uh, with Professor Kim Birchall, who is going to talk about, uh, again, the, the diagnosis, eh? Is it TN and can MVD cure it? Kim. Well, I, again, I want to thank Chris for doing this. Um, this is a tremendous effort. I know how much work he put into this and his staff, and I, I really, we all should appreciate that. So thank you. Um, I, I also, I'm, I'm going to try to go pretty quick and hit what I think is new, new information, new knowledge, but all of it is respectful, respectful of the past and the, the you know, the shoulders of the giants we stand on, you know, Dandy, Janetta, Gardner, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also respecting the fact that um, knowledge didn't stop in 1970, 80, 90, it continues today, which is why we're here talking and exchanging information. So um, I'm going to go reasonably quickly. Let's see if this is going to work. It's not advancing. Not advancing. Oh, are you just going to advance for me? I guess so. So, um, oh, wait a minute. Oh, sorry. It, it started to advance. Can you back it up? This is well into the talk. Keep going backwards. It just, it had a lag there. Okay, let's go. Let me be able now it'll work. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. Very briefly, talk about diagnosis. Again, this is number one, two, and three on my hit parade in terms of dealing with patients. If wrong diagnosis, wrong therapy, no matter what we do. Surgical treatment, I'll mention briefly because I don't really have to in this audience. Um, significance of compression, we already heard from Stina earlier today, and I mean, her work in 2015 was really a landmark, I think, in terms of our understanding of what neurovascular compression means. We'll talk about surgical treatment without neurovascular compression. We've heard a little bit about that already. And then I'll get to some pretty new and exciting stuff about the genetics of uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So again, getting back to classifications, we've had old classifications which weren't very helpful. You know, atypical trigeminal neuralgia, we still sort of deal with that term. We called it type two, but what that means is still, uh, you know, a real, really a problem. Um, so this was our classification, you know, more than at more than 50% episodic was uh, TN1, uh, more than 50% constant was TN2 or the atypical forms. I begin, I'm, I hate to say it, I'm having my doubts about that classification right now, although it's been a useful vehicle for me anyway to understand what's happening. Um, and then we have a long list of other things which cause facial pain we're not going to talk about. So, um, so one of the issues, one of the concepts behind the TN1 and TN2 was with progressive neuropathy, does the pain become more like neuropathic pain elsewhere in the body, which is constant burning, and it doesn't have the episodic quality of trigeminal neuralgia, in that trigeminal neuralgia is pretty unique in that, in that one area. Does that happen? Well, I actually think that that doesn't happen very often. I think it happens with repeated lesions, like in an MS patient, we do radiofrequency lesions, and you know, time after time, their pain gets a little bit less and less typical, although they still have episodic pain. The bigger problem is related to other well more common or much more common etiologies for facial pain, particularly what falls under the rubric of temporal mandibular disorder. And I, I hate to say that because I'm not a dentist and I don't understand this fully, but most dentists don't want to talk about this, don't understand it, don't treat it. It's a pretty big problem and it's very common. It's much, it's probably between 100 and 1,000 times more common than trigeminal neuralgia. So the prevalence at least in the statistics I've found, uh, is about seven to twelve percent in the in the in the world. Um, the incidence of TN—that's the wrong word. Incidence is about 0.01 to 0.02 per year. But it, I just looked at a, a Korean study, uh, and it was a great study looking at the prevalence, and it was about 0.1 percent, so ten times more. But still, pretty rare condition. But forgetting that TMD and its associates are well more likely than TN if for the next person that walks in the door with facial pain, even episodic facial pain. It can mimic trigeminal neuralgia in many important ways. My problem with the diagnosis for years was I always thought it must be the joint. You talk, you hear about patients, I got worked up for TMJ, they told me my joint's fine, so that eliminates that. Turns out TMJ is a rare cause or uncommon cause of facial pain. It is part of the TMD spectrum, but it's by far not a uh, requisite. So uh, the pain 
is in the muscles of mastication. And this is something that neurosurgeons do not know unless somehow you've been introduced this in some other way. This is pain that you can determine on exam, which is why an in-person examination is really critical. But pain in the temporalis muscle, pain in, in the insertion of the temporalis on the coronoid process, intraorally, almost pathognomonic for this problem. Uh, masseter tenderness, tenderness in the, in the posterior ramus of, of the mandible. It takes you about two minutes to do this exam. But if you see those features, stop. You're probably not dealing with trigeminal neuralgia. The pain can radiate into the distribution of the trigeminal nerve, particularly around the eye and into the cheek, even sometimes down the jaw. And it is episodic. I've watched patients have this. They appear to have a, a bout of tic de la rue, grabbing their face and stopping, you know, the way we normally expect trigeminal neuralgia to behave. The difference is that patients with TMD have a baseline pain, usually pretty significant, three, four, five out of 10. If that is the patient you're looking at, stop. That's not trigeminal neuralgia. It's something else that is now mimicking TN. So I, we don't have time to go into all the detail here, but I would just advise you to think about it and maybe delve into it a little bit more. Find a colleague that can help you diagnose these folks. And that's hard to do, by the way, because many of the features, uh, bouts of pain are, are quite typical, but they have that baseline pain. So if you look across these two, uh, columns, uh, many of the features of TMD are what we see in trigeminal neuralgia. Episodic pain is a feature, clearly, but it's on a chronic background that effectively never goes away. And it's not a one uh, out of 10, it's a three, four, five out of 10. Uh, anticonvulsants is, so chronic pain, number one, number two, anticonvulsants don't have a profound effect. If you ask a patient, did the uh, carbamazepine help? Did the gabapentin help? They will say, oh, yes, 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 it helped. Well, how much? Well, 10%, 15%, 20%. It's not the dramatic cessation of pain that we see in most patients with uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So those are the two most important features to consider. You Again, you can diagnose trigeminal neuralgia over the phone, but you need to see these people and examine them. There's no substitute for the exam. And the problem is, is down here, temporalis fan, uh, the posterior ramus of the mandible, intraoral, touching just where the coronary process is, the patient will recoil, it, just a light touch. Um, masseter, all those muscles you need to look at the bite. Uh, we often make them bite down on, the, on a um, tongue blade, and if they just won't bite on that side, and they say, it's, that's my agonizing pain, that's my familiar pain, that's probably what you're dealing with. So exam is a must. So, uh, Diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. It's the most important thing. This problem of TMD can be easily confused, and I see it happening all the time with neurologists. Pardon me if there's any neurologists here, but it happens all the time, and these people are treated for years and years with the wrong drugs and to no avail. Um, so um, <clears throat> it's easily confused and is. Um, as I said, you can listen to a patient talk for two minutes and they'll tell you they have trigeminal neuralgia, but TMD, you have to examine them. And we're in the process, we have a little mini exam, it takes about one minute to do. I'm gonna publicize that and I think it's something to sort of, every neurosurgeon that deals with trigeminal neuralgia should at least know what to look for. Um, should be strongly considered, only on a statistical basis because it's you know, 100 to 1,000 times more common than TN. When you have a typical TN, you should think about it. So surgical treatment, again, I'm gonna go through this real quick. This is the uh, Cochrane statistics published by Joe in uh, a few years ago. Uh, basically, whoops, sorry, back up here. Let me go back. Okay. Um, MVD clearly wins, uh, that's this orange line. The thing that I, that I must admit bothers me when I see these lines flatten out, I haven't seen that, that's not the data we published 20, 30 years ago, it continues to decline at about a four to 5% rate per year, but it still is the winner. And whatever we're doing, as we talked about with Stina, we may be doing a little manipulation of the nerve, a little micro lysis, but whatever it is, it's working. So let's not forget that we're, this is a big success story and that's what we owe to Peter and Gardner and others. Um, if you look at the other things, radio frequency, Helpful, probably a half-life of around four to five years. Uh, 
Uh, that's my favorite procedure. Um, glycerol, I, I did for years, but it doesn't last quite as long, and it is a more, I believe, more difficult procedure. And uh, balloon, I, um, it's kind of not been a big part of my practice ever. I've done it a few times, not, not super helpful for me, but. Um, so, so the RF ganglia lysis, that's my go-to, and I do think if you're gonna treat uh, with MVD, you should have another procedure, either uh, probably one of these percutaneous hartle type technique procedures. Um, I'm not sure that radiosurgery would count, but that's at least an alternative for the patient. But, but I think we, uh, the, the dedicated neurosurgeon that's interested in trigeminal neuralgia should have one of these percutaneous ablative procedures that they've mastered. Um, I think that's really, really important. And you know how that works, going through Freeman Ovalle. This is the whole point of this conference with uh, Superior Sarah Beller here, which I find in almost every case. So when you see this, this is our, you know, this is our meat and potatoes. I mean, Superior Sarah Beller frequently um, duplicated under the nerve, creating more crowding. Um, you know, you drag that out of there and, you know, pretty easily. And then at least what I do, and some may have better ways of doing this, um, I put Teflon between the nerve uh, and the vessels, and I really think this is what Janetta described, and that's, that's basically what, I, what I've done, and our uh, outcome data is based on this. I don't do a sling. I know I've talked to uh, Ludwig, and he does a different procedure, um, and there may be wor work to do on that to show if that works better. No one has shown that yet, as far as I know, but it, it kind of makes sense. Um, so this is the so-called decompression procedure. Again, I may be arguing against myself, but if this was a lumbar disc, we wouldn't consider this to be decompressed if that was the nerve root. We've just introduced compression. This gets to the point of why does MVD work? Uh, is it a chronic injury model, for example? And that's not the first time this question has arisen. Uh, there's a guy, CBT Adams, who I, I uh, who's, um, well, Ludwig, I've talked to CBT Adams, he's still alive, and we've exchanged back and forth and talked, and we even did a video conference together. I don't think this idea is dead. I think there's still an issue here that we might be producing a chronic injury, and that's why MBD works. And I won't say much about it, but this is his idea, and I think it's still worth considering that we're producing trauma either during the dissection and decompression, but maybe there's, there's probably a the gift that keeps on giving in terms of that piece of Teflon in there. The, the evidence that uh, microvascular compression, neurovascular compression produces trigeminal neuralgia is actually pretty weak. Uh, this paper, uh, 2013, uh, you know, not, not very convincing data around that. Um, this is Stina's paper from 2015. Again, the important point with her is that the simple contact, if, if radiologists were asked to, to, um, to uh, to, to vote on the side of the neuralgia based on a grade one contact, it was a coin flip. They couldn't do it. Now, if they had the SINDU grade two or grade three, that is compression or distortion, now we're talking. We had much higher rates of positivity there. So it looks like, at least in this case, the severity of compression has a lot uh, to do with uh, the pot potential that this is a neurovascular syndrome since severe uh, compression is highly associated with TN as opposed to neurovascular compression in general. The problem is most, this is Mark's scale, which I've used, one being contact, two compression, three distortion. Um, it's these two that Stina considered to be, the, she considered this the severe compression category. So those are the ones she was talking about. Now, again, with all love and affection for Mark, one of my heroes, I think Compression, at least in our hand, is almost entirely arterial. I think it does occur. We've published pictures. I think Jonathan showed a couple of those that where the vein clearly distorts the artery. Um, I think those are unusual cases. I also think, as Mark demonstrated, once you start fooling around with, brain, uh, with big veins along the brainstem, you're in tiger country. I think I would be very uh, hesitant to do that. And I probably would still just do an internal neurolysis if I saw one of those, but I haven't seen one for a while. So, but notice there's a mixed bag here in the patients with, with no vessel. You get all kinds of things in the vicinity, but it's not, not etiologic. Here's one of the interesting little statistical things, and Jonathan made this point a different way. 
a, a percentage of adults have neurovascular trigeminal compression. We did that work when he was a fellow. We looked at an age match control uh, series, and it looked like, I think it was 17%, but it doesn't matter whether 14 or 17 or 70. The commonality of, of type 1 neurovascular compression is so great, it means that 99.94% of individuals with neurovascular compression, grade 1, don't have trigeminal neuralgia. So how can that, we can even ascribe that etiologically to the disorder? I think, again, that comes back to Stina's work showing it's really severe compression, which is not nearly as common as the grade 1. Um, so uh, in general, uh, the general population, neurovascular compression is meaningless, which is why, I don't know about you folks, but uh, when I see a patient that's newly diagnosed as trigeminal neuralgia, the first thing they show me is their MRI. Well, my doctor said, I have trigeminal neuralgia because you have this vessel next to the nerve here. Let's talk about your pain a little bit before we go to the MRI scan. Now, what we, again, uh, this is what we all like to see. This is a superior cerebellar artery. We can decompress that quite nicely. Patients are happy. That gives you a good outcome. One of the issues is why does that continue to go downhill over time? I would submit probably because we're producing some chronic ongoing injury and eventually trigeminal neuralgia, which is a progressive condition, catches up with that uh, neurolytic uh, effect of, of MDD. So uh, <clears throat> what about recurrence? Well, recurrence, at least in our hands, had nothing to do with the artery. This is pretty typical. We had a big superior cerebellar here. We had, you know, uh, Teflon here. Now you can argue maybe if I sling that, you know, away from the nerve completely, it wouldn't happen. Prove it. That would be my answer. So what we do here, I'll show you in a bit, is uh, for re recurrence is we'll do this internal uh, neurolysis procedure. So again, one of the big problems with MVD is why, if we've cured it, why does it ever come back? Let's see here. Then the other issue is what about the no neurovascular compression? And I think when I see things like arachnoid adhesions, veins, other things being invoked, I think we're, if you're committed in, a, in almost a religious way to neurovascular or vascular compression or neural compression, you got to find something because that's the problem. I think it's ignoring the fact that it might not be compression. There might be another explanation for it. So we see this all the time, and I will go into detail about this. One of the things that came out when we did this analysis, actually Andrew Coe, one of our fellows, looked at this, and there was a clear distinction between patients, how they presented without neurovascular compression and with neurovascular compression. This is without, this is with, this is age. Clearly, they presented earlier with no neurovascular compression, and almost if you do a normalized distribution, there's a clear peak at a young age. So why is that? When you also look at the age of the patient, and the, and the presence of no neurovascular compression, it goes steadily down from the third, fourth decade to the ni eighth, ninth decade, steadily down to almost nothing, whereas vascular compression goes up. Clearly, we think vascular compression is a, a problem of uh, tortuosity, and that occurs, uh, accrues over age, so that kind of makes sense. But there's a whole problem here of why does this ever happen if there's no vascular compression, and I, I hope I'll have an answer for you here shortly. So these are the two curves. There's a big overlap. And uh, this is no nerve vascular compression. This is vascular compression. But notice this curve goes well out into the eighth, ninth decades here. So it's not simply a problem of young people. Uh, we see it in the older patients, too. Here's the, pro here's the issue, the thing that triggered a big study that I'll mention at the end here. The no nerve vascular compressions are almost entirely female. This blip of males, I think if I were to redo the statistics now, that would be on the baseline, almost nobody. Uh, in other words, there appears with a strong female predominance of no nerve vascular compression, which may in part explains why females have always been a greater proportion of the population with trigeminal neuralgia, because no one's explained that till now. So this is what we see, the no nerve vascular, here's the Obviously, there's nothing around here. Trust me, I don't think uh, there's a, a supermeatal tubercle here, which I know some people are drilling out, which I think is a really bad idea. Uh, but um, anyway, we can't see the porous trigeminus, but we can see right up to the brainstem, there's nothing there. So that patient, we will do what I call this internal neurolysis, which is just an older version of a stripping procedure that used to be, you know, it was a subtemporal tick, basically, back in the turn of this 20th century. Um, and one thing, if you haven't done this, I'll warn you, be careful, you can get profound bradycardia. 
tell the anesthesiologist before you start, you may see some slowing here, because if you jump right in there, uh, the, you'll basically see an entire sweep of an EKG with no QRSs, and then you have to jump over the ether screen and resuscitate the anesthesiologist, because they're, they've now fainted, or they've called a code or whatever they've done. So pre-treat with glyco or atropine, or just be aware, and it can happen in some patients, it happens profoundly, in other patients, not at all. And I suspect that has to do with the, this, the vagal tone and the vagal system in general. So, and I do the same thing, as I mentioned, with a recurrent MBD. I don't go in there and, because, you know, if you remove that Teflon and do all this, you've produced a neurolytic procedure. You've traumatized that nerve. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just do that on purpose. By the way, when you do this on a virgin nerve, like the one I showed earlier, these patients have some numbness briefly, but that goes away. They have almost no permanent hypesthesia. You do it on someone that's had a, an MVD, essentially the same procedure, very numb. Tells me there's a cumulative injury in that nerve. We're just adding to it, but I don't have great quantitative data on that. So when you look at the outcomes, and this is something we were talking about yesterday, Ludwig, um, the outcomes from internal neurolysis are pretty close. Uh, this is the um, basically, it's comparable to the total recurrence rate uh, for MVD over time. So these are old statistics. This is our new newer statistics. So there, it's, it's strange that you can reproduce the effect of MVD by that uh, combing procedure. Um, okay, now to the fun stuff, I, um, which is not published, by the way. Uh, so this kind of made us think there's got to be a genetic element here. When, why would all the females have no nerve vascular compression? Um, and Jonathan did mention some of these um, uh, imaging abnormalities that are present often on bilaterally. And I know Moji has, has done a lot of this work. Why would that be? Um, so we've, we started a study, this is now eight years into this study. Um, we ended up with over a thousand uh, patients. Uh, actually this number is over a thousand and we got more controls now. And, and using um, you know, modern techniques of both uh, genome-wide association study, GWAS, and also whole genome sequencing. The GWAS was performed on every patient, and Moji was a part of that. Pittsburgh was a part of that. I don't know if anybody here, I think we had, and we had six centers in the United States, and Joanna Zakcheska was also part of the study. So they all contributed patients. And the patients had to have um, T, what, what we call TN1, both by that online questionnaire, but also by the physician's impression and diagnosis. So it had to have both of those, which is a pretty, I think, highly purified uh, population. Um, <clears throat> the, you have to do, this has to be done by populations, both not only just Caucasian, but we've just recently looked at da data, for example, in um, Finland, are there any fins here? Fins are genetically different. They don't fit the Caucasian model. And I guess geneticists know this. Um, but we looked at uh, the UK Biobank, and I'll, um, I'll mention that at the end. Um, so you have to do, it, this is not, uh, this is sort of against diversity and equity and all every other thing. But the fact is you cannot look at these, you know, large numbers of control populations which are available um, and compare different uh, ethnic uh, population. So it's all Caucasian. Um, and I, as mentioned, we had, we had a, a, a dual uh, qualification for the study. So I'm, I'm really compressing a lot of work into a couple of just interesting findings. I mentioned the work with the females showing they were oh, almost exclusively represented the ner no neurovascular compression in younger age. We looked at that, those two curves that I showed you, and the crossover point was about 45. So we just arbitrarily said, okay, 40, and I apologize, any female over 45. I, it's not, it's, I'm, not, I'm not a youthist. I, I think we, we have uh, plenty of reason to respect everybody over 45, but that's what we used. Um, and we looked at, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Back up here. Uh, I thought. Oh, I see. I'm going backwards. No, that's it. Sorry. I apologize. Okay. So here's what we found. Um, it, there is a uh, GWAS peak 
uh, around the BDNF gene region. And it's in the regulatory region of BDNF. And that's the sole thing that we found by GWAS. It just stood out in the data. And it was strictly young females, which to me validates the idea that we clinicians have something to offer basic scientists, in this case, a geneticist who, whose methodology is so far above my head, I couldn't begin to tell you. But I suggested, look at this population based on my experience and based on the data, and this fell out of it. So it appears there are single nucleotide polymorphisms in the BDNF region, which is regulatory. And it's an, an unusual mechanism. It's called antisense. And there's two different antisense genes that this is affecting. So we now have almost a genetic marker, we think, for these young females that don't have neurovascular compression. We haven't converted this into a laboratory test. This is all, this again, this is all unpublished. But we hope this will eventually become a, a methodology that's used in so many other conditions we, we face in medicine where we can new, now do genetic analysis to determine what is the actual origin of this. Do they have this, these antisense mutations or don't they? Um, so, and I should say, I mentioned that we, we now compared a like population in Britain uh, from the UK data uh, biobank. They have about a half a million people or so. I think they had somewhere around 400 patients that were alleged to have trigeminal neuralgia. We just basically threw that against the wall and said, do any genes pop out of that uh, that were similar to a list that we had? And the one that popped out, BDNF. So BDNF is increasingly more likely to be the origin. This is the so-called Manhattan plot. This is the BDF, BDNF peak there. Um, this, is the, this, is the, you know, this is basically expanding that plot. And this region, this is a regulatory region of BDNF, shows multiple uh, Genes. It's the ones at the top. This is these because of the uh, multiple comparisons problem with with this type of analysis. You're talking about 25 million comparisons. You've got to, you're looking at p's values of uh, minus seven, minus eight. So that's why only the ones on the very top of this are probably significant. So strong evidence right now, both based on our data and now with this comparison to the bio, UK biobank, that BDNF plays a role in a large number of, well, in this, in our case, seems to play a role in the development of trigeminal neuralgia, but it also plays a role in a, in a growing list of conditions, including inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's. And we can, in a way, benefit from the research in those areas because it opens up a whole new line of therapy. And this has already been tested now in preclinical work of looking at BDNF, um, uh, inhibitors and other things. So it's, it's an approach that's never been looked into in the past. Uh, <clears throat> so I mentioned too that we've, we've now done 100 um, whole genome sequencing uh, on a sample of these patients. And um, <clears throat> this is much more expensive stuff to do. So we've, we're kind of run out of money at the moment. But we've looked at this and what emerged from the whole genome sequencing was that mutations related to myelin, which is what we've always thought was going to be an issue. Also to the epilepsy seizure package. So you, you look with uh, WGS, you can, you can ask a question about keywords, and it falls into these two categories. And that we found, that's what this shows. These are the young females. Again, oh, let me show the, oh, weird. That didn't, uh, doesn't have the baseline. Anyway, this is the myelin, this is seizure. And that's the young females. So there's, they clearly stand out from the pack. So this is another way to think about this, is it appears to be myelin mutations in those younger females. Now, lastly, I wanna mention, uh, we're here about vascular compression. So what, what we did was we took a, 132 patients that were already in our uh, data bank from our uh, national, international study, uh, 89 of which had neurovascular compression and 43 did not. Um, and we, this was analyzed by my fellow two years ago. I had nothing to do with it. He just looked at the videos and looked at the neuroimaging and basically said, this is, a, this is grade one, grade two, grade three, grade zero. And uh, so we used all the information we had, graded the vascular compression on the Sandu scale, and then we already had the, the data. We just had to pull that data for the outcome. And basically what we found was these seven SNPs jumped out at us. Um, 
little complex to look at this, but I'll just describe to you what this shows is there's an association. And it turns out that these five are present in our uh, patients that had neurovascular compression. They were subst substantially significant uh, in our population. And if you did not have neurovascular compression, you had those plus two. So this is sort of the five plus two theory. What it says is that neurovascular compression exists uh, as a cause of trigeminal neuralgia as a predisposer for the development of trigeminal neuralgia, that it's not a, uh, uh, any genome that can do this. It requires specific mutations to lead to the development of this common phenotype of, of trigeminal neuralgia, whether you have vascular compression or don't. I think that's gonna require a lot of uh, replication, but that, that will be published uh, hopefully soon. These are the SNPs that were involved. I can't even tell you what they do. So again, this is the five plus two. Again, if you have patients with grade two to three neurovascular compression, had variants in seven SNPs, but the two out of the seven were present in a, a highly significant way on the patients without neurovascular compression. So my final slide or two, um, what we call trigeminal neuralgia, in my view, is in fact a common phenotype, but it has multiple origins. I think we've described or close to describing a young female population with a BDNF uh, antisense mutation, but I think we're going to see that as a foundation of what will be a, a list of other uh, genetic predispositions for trigeminal neuralgia. So we have a patient population that's generally older that has neurovascular compression, younger that doesn't and that has a BDNF mutation, MS, of course, we know. Again, these phenotypes are all the same. These are very different problems. And of course, the rare tumor and vascular lesion. These are, these are not common, uh, but they can produce the same, same issue. The risk of development of TN1 may in fact ultimately be uh, determined genetically. Female gen gender certainly suggests that neurovascular compression data that we have certainly suggests that. And TN1 appears to occur in the background of a genetic predisposition of, of that I've described, the five plus two. Um, multiple lines of evidence argue that neurovascular compression is not required in all cases uh, for the development of trigeminal neuralgia. There's strong evidence that we've now developed that there's a genetic predisposition for the development of it with and without neurovascular compression. It, again, not to denigrate MVD, it's still the first choice for reasons that we still don't think we fully understand. Um, it's a phenotype, TN is a phenotype. It's not a disorder. It's not a, mo a monolithic disorder. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, Kim. It's a really nice presentation of the science. Just a couple of uh, basic questions. Um, yeah, I, I agree with your kind of conclusion at the end that trigeminal neuralgia is like epilepsy. Not all TN is the same, and epilepsy right. is not all the same. That's right. And there are multiple mechanisms that produce the same phenotype in clinical pictures. So I, I think it's a really fair parallel uh, as much as the reason that the medications work similarly for mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. categories of disease. Mm -hmm. um, second question, what are the SNPs and the normals normal patients with neurovascular compression. So you looked at, you looked at the patients that have symptomatic TN uh, with vascular compression, and they have uh, incidence of SNPs they have at five, five and two. variants that are, that are statistically significantly elevated. Right, correct. what is that five two number, not five two, in the patients who have neurovascular compression that don't have TN? Because you have a large population of those. Well, these are being compared to a control group that doesn't have TN, so that's where the statistics derive. If I'm not sure what your question is. So, when you compare that, that was compared to patients with neurovascular compression, but not TN. No, 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 no. It was com no. It was compared to a control control group that we don't know anything about the baseline neurovascular compression. These are, these are controls that, that are available widely that we just derived. No, no, that, that's what I'm looking for. A, yeah. a set of controls, quote we unquote, don't know. that have vascular we, compression. Great, great, and what's great, there. great. And it depends on then how you define compression. Well, that's whatever yeah. you use for the category work, of TN again, patients. Right, yeah. what work for the future. We don't, that's a huge question. What if you have grade two, three compression, 
And if you don't have those genes, do you not develop it? I mean, it's, yeah. that's an open question, yeah. if that's what you're asking. And that last quick question is, yeah. you, you didn't like drilling off the uh, tubercle, you called the protuberance, the osteoma, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. endostosis. Why did you think it was a quote unquote bad idea? I just think uh, MVD is, is a very um, straightforward operation. It is uh, mostly very uncomplicated. And I think as soon as you start drilling away, and, and you, I'm sure, we've all seen these massive tubercles. Uh, I, I, so I'm, I'm a little, I'm very wary of that idea of getting in there with a drill and starting drilling around. You're right around the porous acousticus. And yeah, wait, wait five presentations. Uh, say what? Who ate five presentations? Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, look, sir. Sure. Yeah. Turn that off. Okay, great. Yeah. Kim, thanks for a, a phenomenal presentation. Thanks I must say, I, I'm very grateful to you because you're one of the few physicians that's changed my practice in terms of treating trigeminal neuralgia in um, terms of a neuralgia. I couldn't be happier. Not. So uh, I think that's a really good sign. Uh, I just want to come back to you on, on whether you leave Teflon in touch with the nerve yeah, or not. Yeah. The reason that I don't do that is a paper by Mark Sandu back in 2008 where he mm -hmm. took 330 patients and looked at those where the Teflon had contact and where yeah, the Teflon yeah. didn't have contact. Yeah. And there was a much greater, I think about 15% difference in terms of the long-term outcome of pain freedom, the ones where there was no nerve contact with the Teflon versus the ones without. Okay. Um, so again, these weren't randomized controlled patients, but you know, I try and learn from the people who came before me and that's the only reason um, I, I take that approach. No, I mean, I, I can't argue against it. I, I just think it's, it is a more elaborate operation. Uh, you described to me a, what sounded like a pretty simple slick technique. I think you should patent that and make everybody pay you a little bit every time they glue that thing up. But, um, but I think that's still one of those open questions. Is, is that a better operation? I'd agree. And, and you could look at it both ways. As we discussed yesterday, if you just do that and don't even touch the nerve and you're honest, I know you're honest, um, that might have a worse outcome. I don't know. I mean, we don't know the answer, but it's certainly an, a, an area for the younger people here to explore. I, and, and again, coming to your point of the genetics and yeah. learning that this isn't one disorder, which yeah. is something we I think that's really important because outcome is probably going to depend on not just on what we do, but even more so on the patients we select. And knowing the genetic background of these patients is going to make a big difference. I think we're going to have some uh, levers that we never had before in terms of particularly putting it in the hands of neurology to say, OK, I think this person has this. Let's because they love blood tests. So they can do a blood test and boom, or a spit test. And now we have your answer. I mean, I, I think it's we've lagged in that area of um, you know, specific therapy, you know, patient specific therapy, but we're now getting closer and closer to that era. We can actually categorize these people and say, well, you have this, we're going to do that. And then, then we're going to have to look at the outcomes of those. Yeah. Thanks. Kim, two questions uh, from Jason Schwab online. Uh, first, what do you make of the male female differentiation when uh, BDNF is not a sex linked gene? Uh, well, we don't know where, and hi, Jason. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't know the derivation of why BDNF seems to be important in females, if that's his answer, if that's his question. The answer is we don't know. It isn't sex linked, but it's probably interacting with a whole bunch of things that are. And we know that I, I kind of emphasize this as a single one that popped up, but we know this is cannot be a single mutation, or we'd see pedigrees, we'd see families. We talked about this before. At least in my experience, uh, a pedigree of, of trigeminal neuralgia is exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare. We, we hear histories, oh yeah, my uncle had it, my grandfather had it, no, he's passed, but we don't really have the evidence that that, uh, that link those two, which is why anybody, frankly, if you have a, a, a pair, a familial pair, super important to get uh, GWAS and whole genome sequencing on that pair because those findings are pivotal for the genetic mechanism and, and um, replication of any kind of linkages because to see the same pattern in both individuals, uh, particularly if you could have another family member that doesn't have it, would be profound. Uh, it's one case can change, is worth reporting. So. And second question, uh, also from uh, Jason, it looked mm -hmm. like you were combing uh, the portio minor. 
yeah. in one of the videos. Uh, yeah. Was he correct about that? And if so, what's your reasoning? Well, Porsche Miner isn't really a miner. Um, Porsche Miner is half sensory, almost entirely C fibers. It doesn't it doesn't have a lot of myelinated sensory fibers, but um, it is not a, the motor route as sometimes we call it. It is a sensory route, sensory plus motor. It did, and there's a question uh, from uh, Dr. Fujimaki. Go ahead, Dr. Fujimaki. I think we could be able to hear Can you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, um, I'm the almost the same question regarding the uh, uh, the person who made the question from the floor. Uh, uh, regarding the uh, recurrence cases with the uh, teflon between the nerve and artery, um, because of that, I think you you only did the uh, partial uh, kind of uh, nerve lysing, nerve lysing, but uh, I think you should you can move that artery away a little bit and that will be, uh, uh, that might be relief the pain in my opinion. Can you get me? I think that, yes, I do. And I understand what you're asking. You're asking why not just go in there and do another decompression. My answer to that is you're probably kidding yourself that you're, that you're moving the artery away. What you're really doing, you notice in, in separating that Teflon from the nerve, you're you're producing injury to that nerve, mm -hmm. and I, I figured we either you know do it or don't do it. But there, you have no choice when there's Teflon against the nerve. You are going to damage that nerve, and so I'm I'm trying to produce an injury that will uh, be consequential and lasting. So that's but I can't prove that. That's my philosophy though. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, yeah. Next yeah. talk uh, is uh, Dr. Ahmed Rada.